Our uh, featured speaker today, uh, John Hess, is a professor emeritus of biology from the University of Central Missouri. He is an uh, evolutionary biologist, an accomplished photographer. In fact, he has a book, which I'm sure I'll tell you about, that's in its second printing of, um, uh, of the Galapagos Islands. I think there's some sitting back there. I should have mentioned that at the break. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Those, and like I said, those were his pictures that we saw during the uh, um, coffee break. I met uh, John and his wife, Gina, uh, when I was speaking at uh, Kansas City Oasis in the, in the fall. And uh, they mentioned they were going to be down here in Houston and graciously offered to do a talk. And I think uh, you're going to be thrilled. And uh, I mean, it was just great to reconnect with them and uh, very uh, grateful for him sharing his time and talents with us this morning. So let's give a warm welcome to Houston Oasis to our new friend, John Hess. Well, this will be done with a little less grace than I had in mind. But um, that's, that's the, way, uh, the way it is. I'm not really a speaker. I'm more of a scientist first, and then a writer, and then a photographer, not necessarily in that order. Uh, and uh, so uh, I won't have the polish that you're used to when Mike talks. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course, uh, in, uh, in uh, in Houston. Uh, we've been to visit folks at uh, MD Anderson and, and uh, I'm uh, happy to report that I will not be seeing them again. And so um, we're going to go back north. Uh, but I've been um, provided an opportunity uh, to speak to a group, this group, uh, that has impressed me tremendously. Uh, my wife pointed out the article in Time Magazine last, uh, last fall. My wife, I should say, of some 31 years who uh, you might mistake for a trophy wife, uh, but uh, she's been with me through the long haul here, and she's just a trophy anyhow. No, she never, she never was. It's a tough crowd. <laughs> Well, I've uh, since run past my, my time. My title here is Revising Our Destiny. <clears throat> uh, I, uh, I'm a photographer, as I said, first, and so uh, I would like to uh, just talk about uh, pretty pictures and the fascinating biology uh, that accompanies them, uh, but that's not the most important thing to talk about, uh, I don't think, and so uh, we're going to talk about our destiny. <clears throat> um, Polls show that about 65% of the voting American public feel like we're headed in the wrong direction. I do too. Uh, that I see as simply a matter of angst. Uh, doesn't, I mean, maybe all of those want to go in a different direction, 65 different directions. Uh, but everybody's upset about it, uh, or at least two thirds of us are. <clears throat> so, um, this is going to be a, a talk which is uh, not particularly uh, as much fun as uh, one of the nature type talks might be, uh, but it's uh, maybe perhaps more like physical therapy, uh, but uh, equally, equally necessary. My text for today is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter. Oh, wow. Nah, I'm just playing with you. Actually, I don't have a text, um, but it raises an interesting question, it, like what is the source of my authority? Uh, shall I quote Sagan or Dawkins or Quinn? Um, and what is their authority? Uh, none of us claim revealed wisdom, so we'll have to rely on our best understanding of the world through science as we see it and through the power of our cortex, uh, which is full of holes as we shall see. My starting point uh, is that we really, really need to get serious about carbon emissions. That's, that's the start of this, uh, <clears throat> the source of this talk. And the problems uh, that are associated with it uh, require governmental action, and that requires popular support, and so we have no option but to um, try to persuade people that this is something that needs to be done. 
folks who are either unconvinced or genuinely antagonistic to the idea need to change their minds. And anyone who's tried to do that uh, is aware of the enormous resistance, and I speak as a long-term combatant uh, in the evolution creation wars. But this talk isn't about the argument. You can see that anywhere. It's about the resistance. So here's my question. How is it possible for people to act consistently and enthusiastically, even furiously, against their own best interests? It's easy to see why I might want to cheat someone else. It's not so clear as to why I might want to cheat myself. These subjects are, of course, difficult to talk about because they're complicated and they require a lot of introspection. Conversations about values touch deeply held convictions, some of which are maladaptive. It's difficult because the conflict is not a logical one. It's between emotion and reason. These counters are often beyond frustrating. We can choose to ridicule people who disagree with us, uh, and uh, it's uh, fun uh, to do. <laughs> However, uh, I happened on a, a sentence from David Brooks in the New York Times a few weeks ago. He said, ridicule becomes less fun as you become more aware of your own frequent ridiculousness. Uh, so we need to keep uh, balance here. And more importantly, uh, we need to have their support. They need to be enticed, not defeated. They need to be uh, born again, shall we say because we need that enthusiasm that they now apply against um, the arguments that I would, uh, I would hold uh, dear to me. We should note at the outset that the disagreement we're talking about, really any form of denial, is not about the facts. Arguments between spouses, I'm told, <laughs> are usually not about the subject of the argument. Um, who takes out the trash? Who rolls the toilet paper the wrong way? Although there is a right way. <laughs> um, these aren't worth an argument. Uh, if it generates a lot of heat, it's probably about something else. In this case, the, gener the uh, disagreement generates a great deal of heat and it lies at the core of our very being. It's about who we think we are. And that is part of what I want to talk about. The fossil fuel industry assures a steady flow of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. To be sure, all of us individually buy the carbon and turn it into CO2. But we have little choice given the way that our society, that our society is constructed we really need to change some laws, but uh, the industry is blocking action by our elected individuals, who, it must be said, we continue to elect anyway. So far, the industry has convinced the majority of the electorate to work as a team to gnaw away at our life support system. If you were to try to explain this to an outside party, uh, you would find them incredulous. And I seem to have misplaced a page here. Uh, even so, we have chosen the name sapiens to refer to ourselves, homo sapiens. Uh, and that alone is pregnant with meaning. A couple of decades ago, I read a book by Daniel Quinn, who is a Houston uh, native. The book was Ishmael. It is profound and accessible, and I recommend it to everybody. In it, Quinn provides us with a definition of culture, a people enacting a story. Now, culture has a lot of parts, it's a lot of things, but if you're limited to just five words to, descri to describe culture, that's pretty good. It sounds innocent enough, enacting a story, something like a school play, uh, but it is powerful beyond my imagination and probably yours as well. Let me illustrate with the great westward movement of the 19th century, which was driven by the idea of manifest destiny. I found an image that is also pregnant with meaning. It's one of those images that have to be seen to be believed. Words fail me. 
And there she is. Wow. <clears throat> Built into our vision of ourselves is our superiority over, well, just about everything. <laughs> this perception is seen in the extreme by the posture of England at the peak of empire as Americans of like mind at about the same time frame, we enthusiastically embraced Manifest Destiny. It was our destiny to go west and to take all of that Indian land. Nothing goes so spontaneously as greed married to the will of God. The painting you're looking at is titled American Progress, and it was done by John Gaston, 1872, commissioned by George Crofit who was a publisher of Western Travel Guides. His description of it, I'm gonna quote you from him here. He says, in American progress, a diaphanously and precarious clad America floats westward through the air with a star of empire on her forehead. In her right hand, she carries the school book, testimonial to the national enlightenment. While with her left, she trails the slender wires of the telegraph that will bind the nation. Fleeing her approach are Indians, buffalo, wild horses, bears, and other game. Interesting sequence there. Uh, disappearing into the storm and the waves of the Pacific coast, they flee the wondrous vision. Well, one hardly knows where to begin with that, uh, but it does make the point the, um, that uh, this was embraced not only by people selling guides to the West, but the, the whole of the movement was a very powerful one. So we'll leave that. Uh, we saw this same power unleashed in Germany after the First World War when Adolf Hitler came to power, claimed that it was the destiny of the Aryan peoples to assume their rightful place as the master of all races. It truly struck a chord among Germans. It struck the same chord that Manifest Destiny did among Americans. It was what the German people wanted to hear, and many of them, enough of them, swallowed it whole and committed themselves to it with the same vigor, it must be said, that we did for Manifest Destiny. Every culture has a story, and it is powerful beyond expectation. The story itself is always simple, but its roots and branches run everywhere, which we will see as this uh, unfolds. The story tells us where we came from, why we are here, and where we are going. That is our destiny. Almost everything we do is influenced in some way as we try to enact that story. In Ishmael, Quinn introduced me to mother culture. She requires an introduction because she is nearly invisible. A strong woman, she speaks softly and carries a big stick. And the big stick is the power of repetition. Consistent and endless repetition from all of our most trusted sources, parents, teachers, peers, not to mention all of those hours spent in front of the television, some 20 to 40 percent of waking hours, where we are enrolled in a class in our culture. That is where our wants and fears and our expectations are shaped so as to be profitable. The incredible ubiquity of this information is part of what makes it invisible. There is no belief quite so invisible as a belief held by everyone. In the interest of time, uh, we'll leave mother culture here, but note that it's very hard to undo a conviction that she has midwifed. Those convictions are rarely stated, but they are deep and they are absorbed as efficiently as we do language. We learn by watching and listening, little ears, you know. And we have taken to heart the right things to think and to do as told to everybody around us. That's how we become enculturated. Attitudes are reinforced so relentlessly uh, will vigorously resist any change, and a simple logical argument is not up to the task. And here is why. I confess that where I'm going to take you is a vast oversimplification. 500 million years ago, our ancestral DNA was housed in a fish. 
That DNA generated a brain that regulated fish behavior quite effectively. The fish, behavior, the fish brain was carried on with modifications through amphibians and reptiles, and we retain it. I prefer to call it the reptilian brain, even though there are some, uh, some friction uh, with the psychological world about that. Uh, and that makes two systems that control our behavior and gives us something of a split personality. With the primates, our family line began to develop a rational veneer that allowed more flexible and sophisticated control over our behaviors. That layer has blossomed into the mammalian cerebral cortex. Wherein lies our reason. The two systems talk to each other across the ages, but they don't agree about everything. We wear this cortex like a yarmulke over our reptilian brain. Our brains are incredibly complex, and like all the rest of our parts, they've been built of accidents piled upon more accidents. Now and then, some of these accidents have favor favorable consequences. And now, by now, our brains are quite a jumble of uh, jumper wires, conduits that are run this way and that, and the whole bound into a package with the liberal use of duct tape. <laughs> we need a human model, and so I have one here. <laughs> um, try to suppose a normal brain here. Animal behavior has been steered by this arrangement, this cortex and reptilian core, for 500 million years at least, and it still does the job. Our human cortex is only three million years old, give or take a few million years. Uh, and uh, with only three million years of experience, it is not very well integrated with the ancient control system that we find beneath it. Imagine the second lieutenant fresh out of ROTC. Think uh, Lieutenant Fuzz from Beetle Bailey. Let's call this reincarnation second lieutenant Cortex, Homer Cortex. He is in the field with a master sergeant, a lifer, and the lieutenant is lecturing him about how the Army works and how is the best way to accomplish this mission. This about describes the relationship between these two parts of our brain, the one about which we are so full of ourselves. Second Lieutenant Cortex has potential, but he needs a few hundred million years of seasoning. The Cortex makes decisions and tries to tell the reptilian brain what to do, but it is often overpowered by 500 million years of experience that drive the passions that simmer down there. It is simply inadequate to do the job. Of course, you hear only half of this argument. It's a debate without words because while your intellect has words, the reptilian brain speaks only in urges. Bumper stickers target the reptilian brain. You see one, America is a Christian nation. And your cortex reads it and to your brain, to your, to your reptilian brain, and it gets angry. But you feel this compulsion then to say something about it, and you'd like to, but uh, well, it's a bumper. Uh, and, and what do you say? Since the Enlightenment, we like to think that we are, and this is a loaded uh, sequence, autonomous rational actors. We think our rational selves are in charge of the beast, like this. The horse is incredibly powerful, we, but we have subdued it. Subdued is a big word with us. It may be our culture's absolute favorite word. The beast is entirely under our control, and we are pretty smug about it. Actually, uh, this is closer to the truth. <laughs> there, are, there are times when we are neither autonomous nor rational. And we have a great ability to fool our rational selves. We have what Steven Pinker calls a baloney generator. <laughs> Nobody has exactly located it yet, but it makes up plausible explanations for why we did things. Um, we are so good at it, 
that we can rationalize nearly any action and still believe that we are steering a rational course. Here's a rational message. I will be healthier in almost every way if I cut down on sugar intake. <laughs> Plenty of research to document this. There is still, however, that donut pile over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, plenty of it. And so um, my reptilian brain is talking to me. <laughs> uh, there are no words, of course, just urges. But the meaning is clear and it's saying, me want. <laughs> my cortex says, how about a nice celery stick? <laughs> Something with less sugar. Um, I very well, wait, very well may decide to indulge, but uh, well, just this once, uh, it's free. <laughs> it's such a beautiful day. <laughs> it's such a crummy day. <laughs> and so uh, the rational self has just yielded to the reptilian brain. But I can feel better about it because my, uh, by claiming that I decided to eat the donut because of whatever the baloney generator has whipped up for my peace of mind. <laughs> to be sure, the rational self actually pulls the levers, lifting, chewing, swallowing. But in this case, the creature behind the curtain, under the yarmulke, is calling the shots. And it's been shaped by its evolutionary history and by mother culture. And that's what we call free will. <laughs> rid of that, I'm starting to salivate. <laughs> this particular misunderstanding of how we make decisions was a major flaw on, in the thinking of, of Enlightenment scholars. We are not autonomous, rational <clears throat> actors exactly. But the idea persists, particularly among liberals and scientists, like myself, who think that a well-presented argument should settle the case. Clearly it does not. And that fact is more than a little frightening. So uh, we know about enacting a story now. We've given a nod to mother culture. We know about the mismatch of reason and emotion, the mixed marriage in our skulls. There is one other element here, and it's about time and flexibility. Our worldview is so very slow to respond to what we know about the world. Our story is ancient and it is deeply carved into our history and our literature, into our language and metaphors. We, typical Americans, still hold on to ancient ideas that are, that are so commonplace that we don't notice them. Generally, they are benign. Take this, for instance. What am I doing? That's right, and why am I looking up? Ah, because that's where God is. Everybody knows that. Even if you're entirely convinced that there isn't a God, you still know where he lives. <laughs> it's up there. He was put there by the ancient ideas of the earth that included the firmament. And that was abandoned at 200 AD, or CE as we might prefer to say. But some part of us still thinks that. It's buried in our culture and it's witnessed by everybody knowing what I had in mind when I assumed that particular pose. Lunar missions, space station notwithstanding, he's still up there. <laughs> it's very hard to uh, root that out. We have only <clears throat> second lieutenant cortex to do it with. Some ancient ideas are malignant. And here's another one that is widely held today and it comes from the same place. We are separate from all other animals. So when we speak of groups of animals, we don't say things like dogs and animals. That's a compositional error. Any editor would not only correct you, but likely wrap your knuckles. It is entirely correct, however, to say humans and animals. If you Google humans and animals, you'll get an avalanche of these sorts of sentences, titles. Why do neuroprotective drugs work in animals, but not in humans? Testing drugs on animals does not work to help humans. This isn't a slip of the tongue, and it's something that's very hard to avoid, even as an aware writer, because it just bubbles out. It's the way we've been taught to see the world, our history, and therefore our 
language makes it almost inevitable. It's, this particular one is very difficult to work around because we don't have a word for them. We've taken the word for all of us animals and made it mean all of them except for us. <laughs> so we don't have a word for just them. I mean, for, for just all of us. We, we've taken that word animals and, and uh, um, polluted it. Here uh, are a few other convictions. The first of these is man is special among all the creatures. The second conviction is that the earth was made for man and it is his destiny to rule over it. Comes right out of Genesis, plain enough. Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth. There are two key words here. The first is subdue and the second is have dominion over. 783,000 words in the Bible and the loudest one is subdue. Second loudest is to have dominion over. Quite a pair. Uh, neither of those are words that we or any of my Christian friends might wish to be the message that comes from the Bible. Quinn puts these two convictions together and sees the most dangerous idea in the world. He puts it this way. Humans belong to an order of being that is separate from the rest of the living community. I agree with him. I think that collectively we do believe that. It allows us to conclude that things that happen out in nature, out there or somewhere, uh, are not really relevant to us here because we're special. <laughs> we are children of God and they are not. We have souls and they do not. Everything has been put before us to be used. In 1997, Alabama opened a trial spear season for deer and wild pigs, where you were entitled to take a deer with a spear, if you could catch it, I suppose. Uh, Loincloth optional. <laughs> a member of Alabama's Conservation Advisory Board defended the program this way. He said, this is a quote, God placed us in control of the animal kingdom, and I don't think he intended that it be abused, but he put it there for our usage. It's not odd. I mean, it's all over the place, but it's one of those things that you just don't say. It's one of those beliefs uh, that everybody believes, and so it's not a belief. It's just the way things are. These convictions are, at the very least, a substantial component of why we are where we are in relation to the natural world, a term I use with regret because it's only a step away from out in nature. But I don't have a proper way to say it because our language doesn't have us uh, have an ability to do that. Here, our destiny needs revising. Nobody says this out loud either, but nevertheless, it is our expectation. We expect that we are destined to create a technological paradise here on Earth where nearly every comfort has been eliminated. We don't even have illness. We may even become immortal. In due time, we will go on to expand into the universe and dominate that as well. We have Star Trek and Star Wars uh, and the Jetsons uh, <laughs> to make it seem like a foregone conclusion. It's simply an extension of manifest destiny, and it's grand. It is unseemly, inconceivable even, that instead of mastering the universe, we might die choking on our own waste. A much more probable outcome, however. Because of our beliefs, big energy can easily convince us, collectively, uh, that there isn't really a problem because we're special, because it's our destiny to have dominion, and it's just going to happen, we desperately, therefore, cling, cling to these beliefs that it's not so. That's just simple denial. Because we're terrified of the changes ahead if it's true, and they are going to be substantial. So what to do? Right now, our principal focus has to be on cutting carbon emissions. That's a massive undertaking, and we desperately need to do that right now. But that is only a start because it's the attitude behind it, not uh, the event itself as such. We much prefer to conquer, to defeat, 
We don't like being subordinate to anything. And since we are at war with the world itself, our victory is at the same time our defeat. Some years ago on a PBS segment, uh, an ecologist summed up the, st the problem of the steadily declining fisheries uh, off the coast of New England, and his summary has stayed with me as a kind of model tragedy. He said, each year, regulatory agencies agreed to programs that might have worked if they'd done it earlier. And each year, they reject more stringent programs that might work and to which they will eventually agree, but only after it's too late for them to work. <laughs> Quinn looks at the future this way. Speaking as a man of about my age, he says, during your lifetime, something truly extraordinary is going to happen. Something truly extraordinary, something equivalent to the adoption of agriculture. The people of our culture will learn to live sustainably on this planet, or they won't. Either way, it will be truly extraordinary. <laughs> well, my time is up, uh, probably beyond it. Uh, I don't want to leave you on such a negative note, but there is indeed, uh, it's hard to put a smiley face on, on this. Uh, but here are two of them. Uh, there is plenty of evidence that we have reached a cultural tipping point as we approach a climatic one. It's a high stakes page turner about the nature of life on Earth and about who we are, and it's not fiction. Things will begin to happen more quickly now. Here are just two important indicators that the age of denial is coming to a close, and both of these are really huge. The first is the U.S.-China Joint Announcement for Climate Change. Please hold your cynicism until after the uh, Q&A. <laughs> uh, more importantly, January 31, the New York Times says that 78% of Americans and half of Republicans support government action to curb global warming. These numbers can only increase as Floridians continue to get their feet wet. <laughs> My personal reaction to these positive single signals is a great swelling of gratitude for all the work done by dedicated people who've been pushing this idea for two or three decades since the idea of climate change became irrefutable. We've educated a new generation, maybe two, since the science on climate change became so powerful, and now is the time to really push. Between efforts, however, between efforts to push, you might stop by Starbucks and try their latest uh, drink. <laughs> I'll be happy to respond to any questions or comments that, uh, that you might have. And somebody will turn me off when I run out of time. Yes, sir. But have you considered that maybe uh, government action, heavy government action, may shoot us in the foot, may make things worse? And as an example, at the turn of the century, a little bit later, we had train systems all over the country, electric trolley buses in all the cities, electric cars, mm -hmm. and through government actions, now everything's running on diesel and gasoline. Well, actually, it was through the actions of Standard Oil, Texaco, and, and, uh, and governments, and, that, uh, that the, uh, and Firestone. And, well, the government cooperated. Yeah, exactly. Cooperated. Right. Uh, but those uh, companies got together and they bought up uh, trolley lines and, and ripped up the tracks and did things that pushed us into this arrangement. It wasn't entirely government action. And yes, the government can run us in a ditch, there's no question about that. Uh, we've done it many times. Still, if you've read uh, Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons, Sure. He makes quite clear that there's no way to do this without uh, a, to, to protect the commons, and this is a commons, uh, without some central agency that regulates it. There just is no way to do it, and, and that's a very convincing article to me. Yes, sir. Is there any way to uh, uh, be able to fly without polluting, with, you know, just polluting the air? Uh... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can do gi giant airships. Oh, and float. Yes, sir. Yeah. I've seen models for enormous computer powered uh, sailing vessels uh, the size of tankers. There's a solar airplane flying around the world right now with, with somebody in it. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. Well, that's a different. Yeah. That, yeah that's I'm, a tough I, one. I, I'm talking about mass transportation, uh, which we now use with jets. 
Uh, yeah, it, well, it can be done that way, but it can't be done on a three hours from San Francisco to DC. Yeah. On, on a, on a it can't be done on a, on a, on a dirigible. Yeah. No. Yes, sir. What are the things besides not burning fossil fuels uh, do you see that we have to change? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> industrial agriculture. Oh, oh yeah, green. every one of those. Paper Bosch process. Well, the number one the one that nobody wants to talk Can about. Can you repeat the question? Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. What do we need to do besides uh, stop burning fossil fuels? And the number one thing is we have to stop growing. Uh, and nobody wants to touch that. That's the third rail. Mm -hmm. That's why we're talking about carbon instead of what we ought to be talking about. All my green liberal friends hate me wanting to bring this up and they don't want to talk about it either. No, they, no, because because the first thing you do is you get in a, in a tangle with a bunch of other things. Uh, yes. But if we were to change our attitude uh, and if we expand into a lot out here, we don't just say it's a vacant lot that's doing nothing. We say this is a lot where there's a, an intense ecological community and they're cleaning the air for us. And they need to be there because we need them. Yes. Not because they're cool, which they are, or beautiful, or any of that, we have to have it. And then there's a the whole ethical thing, which is difficult to argue with, with someone who wants to do otherwise, uh, that um, pushing species into extinction is really a bad idea. <laughs> really a bad idea. Uh, Ehrlich, uh, many years ago, said it's like, it's like uh, popping the rivets out of a jet that you're flying in and seeing how many you can get rid of without losing <laughs> And so, well, anyhow, there are other questions here. Are we out of time? It's a good time, Rep, but we can do one more. Sure. Yes. I, every time I turn on my TV, I'm bombarded with this propaganda about buy cars, buy cars, then it's buy insurance, buy insurance for your car, and then comes the fast food commercials. All right. But then I heard a commercial the other day that said if the car were designed today, it would be designed on the perfect energy source, electricity. Hey. But electricity is the biggest carbon polluter of all. So well, it is how are we going to get around? It is and it isn't. Uh, the way that it isn't is if it's derived uh, by solar means. And that means either wind or uh, direct solar. Uh, I saw a really fascinating little picture. It's just in a, in a Time Magazine piece at the bottom. Uh, and it was a picture of a parking lot in Las Vegas. And over it, uh, like little carports, Every place had a solar receptor. If you think how many thousands of square miles of parking lot could not be covered with solar collectors, which are, by the way, getting progressively cheaper and more efficient, and will continue to do that, um, it's, it's just stunning. We, we, don't, we just don't want to do it. And we don't want to do it because of um, the value of the carbon that's in the ground. And that carbon has got to stay there. If we eventually get it out, we're, we're done. I shouldn't say we're, I mean, the planet will be here, there will be lots of things here, and there will be a, a but our culture will disappear entirely uh, with the refugees. And the, I mean, it's a really ugly thing. And I'll stop there. Let's uh, give it a